So I'm Todd Myers, and my partner here is Kevin Fitzsanna. We're going to walk through a little bit of history and um, how we started to build a relationship with uh, the Mesos community, and, and especially Mesosphere, and uh, where we are and where we're going um, the next year or so. So we felt it was very important uh, as we looked at the type of data that we have to be prepared to process over the next 10 or 20 years, that we have to have something that's abstracting and taking care of the resource negotiations and scheduling for us. So uh, Apache Mesos was, was a, a no-brainer in our, in our mind. And um, during that process over the past three or four years, we had been uh, dabbling in a framework called Scale that was specifically focused prior to Mesos on doing batch processing and even prior to uh, containerization. Um, and as that evolved, we've, it was a perfect fit to take our NGA scale uh, open source product, project and put that into the, the uh, universe uh, deployments. And I believe uh, that is part of the universe deployments in uh, Mesosphere as we speak, DCOS. But beyond that, in order for us to get to the scale of processing, which you see in the bottom right hand corner, um, we needed something to be able to insert packages without having to wait for three or four months of meetings and requirements and having uh, different people compete against different priorities. And so we needed a way to bring these things in and have them be isolated, um, localized for different types of deployments, whether it's a, um, a domain that's on an open domain or whether it's a domain which is a closed domain. So we have uh, embarked on g gathering up the universe packages, adding some of our own, and we've We've created an environment that allows us to control the entire local universe deployments not attached to the Mesos masters, and we're gonna go through that, and Kevin will highlight that in subsequent slides. So why are we doing this? We needed something to come in and basically create a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift of how we are going to bring in framework services, containerization, evolve our programs, our applications, our system designs, so that we have an environment that allows us to quickly insert without having to go through the regular uh, process of um, bidding for contracts and vendors competing against each other. So we wanted to abstract that and provide a gateway. And so for us, this app, the abstraction of DCOS was perfect um, to provide a unifying environment for our infrastructure. It also leverages um, a great opportunity for us to have the large, what we call large programs of record use an environment without them having to create a separate architecture. Uh, we also have uh, created an automatic uh, process for uh, authority to operate, which means each customer that comes into the cluster that we host, um, they don't have to worry about that. So we're laying the foundation, and the foundation is, so we want to greatly enable our developers. We want the developers to be able to program to geo applications and data sources and phenomenologies and we're starting to see that we're going to a scale that we've never had before. So, to speak a little bit about metrics. Um, in the past, we would have very low utilization on our machines, uh, single digit numbers, a uh, percentage of CPU. And we have seen over the past year, on average, between 50 to 75 at the peak utilization of every process that we're running uh, for certain phenomenologies. And this is really important because NGA is a um, uh, service provider for the Department of Defense and also Intelligence Committee for Geospatial Intelligence, GEOINT. And that data has to be leveraged and available quickly. And as we go forward over the next 10 to 15 years, um, the data sets are getting larger, the sensors, the overhead the satellites are coming in, and we need to have this type of architecture right where the data is coming in. And so this is really setting the stage for both DOD and Intelligence Committee. So I'm going to hand it over to Kevin, and we're going to talk about one of the key components of, which is really important for us, is addressing the DCOS in isolation. Thanks, Todd. I hope everyone's enjoying the week uh, so far, last day, um, ready to get back and apply everything you learned back at work. Uh, so I'm Kevin Fitzhenry, engineer supporting NDAS, NGA contractor. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, when I get to the next slide, some examples of what we thought were uh, probably some beneficial things to more than just us put out there in the community and start conversations about. But before I get there, um, it helps to kind of give a, a little bit of background and some of the design constraints, uh, design goals we knew we wanted to start with from the get-go to kind of set ourselves up for uh, success um, because it is a kind of rigid environment, a lot of policy and regulations um, being in a DOD area. 
um, for, for good reason when there's warfighters depending on uh, the products or uh, uh, output that we're producing. So you don't want uh, unreliable systems to get out into production or systems that can't protect the data in the proper way to get out into production. So in, in gist, this uh, slide next to me here kind of puts all that into a few sentences. Um, but the gist of it is we knew we wanted a repeatable way to uh, deploy a DCOS cluster in an incredible fashion in an AWS cloud-like environment um, using as much uh, DevOps CI CD automation as possible because we're not a real uh, uh, deep staff team. So we knew we didn't have time to uh, continually repeat manual processes. So um, we needed a, a way to kind of set that uh, those tasks off to the side and uh, execute them whenever we needed to without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, so having said that, um, that's, that's, that was a, a big undertaking to try to do this and uh, go through accreditation process, um, have security internal do the vetting of uh, password requirements and data encryption at rest and all the things that come with uh, being in our arena. Uh, so uh, we the strategy was break things into kind of a, a three-tier stack. Um, with the bottom of that stack, we refer to it as tier one, uh, be the, the cloud services that we consume from the Amazon-like environment. Um, the next stack on top of that is our tier two, which would be uh, the actual DCOS cluster and the sidecar components that kind of enable it and uh, fit it into our unique in enterprise configurations. Um, and then the last tier on top of that would be the tenant tier, tier three. Um, so, uh, knowing who our user was going to be, we want to do everything in those first two tiers, what we refer to as the core, to kind of enable that and empower that developer who would be our users, we refer to them as tenants, uh, to just show up in the cluster with their little bits of code that uh, are unique to their application. Um, just to make up an example real quick, like human resources wanting to do a new time tracking uh, application uh, for time card systems. They're probably going to have a database cluster. Postgres, whatever it is, a um, container that's unique to the code that whatever they're doing, their ETL or processing on the database, and a web front end. So they could just show up with those three little bits um, and inherit all the work we've done on the uh, core tier one and tier two pieces without them having to reinvent that wheel, them wanting to do their own DCLS cluster and uh, security pulling their, how, uh, their hair out because they'll need to go through and do all the reviews for that unique cluster in addition to our cluster and anyone else that wants to do a cluster. It's not a uh, internal security process, review process isn't, isn't uh, I've done DCOS once over here in this corner, so we don't have to do it again for these other guys. It's every time you go through and install of a, an application, you have to do that accreditation process. So they get to um, take advantage of in a bite-sized approach for the accreditation process, everything we've done on the underpinnings in the core. So. Um, Having said that, let's go on to the other slide with the examples. Uh, so I won't have time to go through all of these. I'll have a, a few minutes if we're going to save some time for Q&A afterwards. So maybe one or one and a half-ish uh, out of these. So if I don't talk about one that's near and dear to your heart on this list, um, I'll be around the rest of the day. So come hunt me down, and we'll talk about it. So. Um, so to expand on that previous example for uh, HR, so say HR wanted to do a, a time tracking system as my previous example. Uh, what if there's 48 different ongoing activities just within HR alone, and they all independently decide that they want their own DCOS cluster, and they all show up to the security, internal security team and say, this is what we're going to do. Security is going to go a little crazy trying to wrap their arms around what all these environments are doing um, and having to review all of these independently and then keep track of them throughout their life cycle as they're running in a production environment. Um, so us knowing that, we want to take kind of the, the, the scalability piece that's lacking on the human security side and automate that as much as possible. So um, we thank Ben and the team, the, the federal guys, uh, uh, Reagan and Keith and uh, uh, support engineers that went through some of our qu crazy requests that we submitted um, to make some changes in uh, the baseline offering of DCOS. And, uh, documentation updates so that we could do what we want to do on this uh, second bolt for the local universe. Um, in that example of 48 different clusters, there's going to be uh, 48 different local universes that uh, in this isolated environment, we have to roll our own local universes because there won't be internet connectivity to the, the vanilla setting that's in a cluster when you first turn it on as uh, I think it's uh, universe.mesosphere.com. Um, that's all the community contributed packages and 
security is not going to have enough time to go review every new one that gets dropped into that uh, public GitHub that gets rolled into that uh, mes uh, universe mesosphere.com site. So um, we went to security early on, knowing this was going to be a, a future problem, and said, hey, um, and at the same time working with Mesosphere, we want to extract that local universe off of the cluster and set it off on dedicated machines on the side, independent of a cluster, and that allows us to wrap it with an off-scale group um, and put an ELB in front of it, and now we can farm out that URL to other people in the DOD, consume it ourselves, hand it out to other people, and then work with security to say, hey, we know that these are kind of the, the popular items out in the Mesosphere um, universe that, uh, I think everyone's familiar with the universe, but if you're not, it's kind of akin to the CentOS uh, Yum repos for just adding packages on the fly to your cluster um, in a Linux sense. So um, now we can give them, like, uh, we know we want Jenkins, we know we want uh, Postgres and Cassandra, and they went and took that list of 20-ish or whatever, looking at Todd, however many we had, um, knowing that's just a starting point, it's going to change and let them kind of uh, peruse through at their pace through that, that baseline set of applications that would be, be available internally to our teams and others in DOD um, behind DISA firewalls to uh, consume those. And they came, gave us a thumbs up on those items. I'm um, like, great, fantastic. Uh, and then we set up a, a pipeline that would go grab those um, artifacts out of the um, public uh, GitHub uh, universe uh, repo and kind of create that big, large 10 gig a 10-ish double-digit gig uh, image, pull that inside and do all the security vetting and accreditation uh, regulations that we have to abide by, uh, malware detection, that kind of thing, um, and put those on dedicated machines off cluster and uh, do uh, uh, vulnerability on the fly testing and kind of fail those unit tests if we see any weirdness going on. Um, and security liked that idea because now they have like a central place they can go to and kind of wrap their arms around and know this is the baseline. Um, going back to that 48 example, uh, 48 different clusters in HR, if they all had their own little universes, uh, security would never really be able to keep up with developers browsing in the user interface and clicking that one, uh, one button single install for deploying this and deleting that. It'd be constantly changing. New stuff's coming and going out of the uh, public universe. Um, so um, now they have like a, a bite-sized approach to doing this accreditation, which they like. Um, so working with... Uh, uh, Mesosphere figured out how to rip that apart, put that on its side behind a auto scale group, and um, now everyone can kind of take advantage of that themselves. So uh, then that would trigger a, a process if, say, another group outside or even ourselves, I want to add these three new things. I see you have these, but you don't have these. How hard would it be to add? We'd trigger that process for the security to say, here's going to be the delta, and then go off and come back and give us a thumbs up. Yeah, we're cool with those. And our pipeline would trigger, um, based off the changes we commit in a, a master branch internal in Git, um, to go through that pipeline, pull in the new artifacts, and kind of canary them through. Um, and then everyone just, uh, and then the wiser developers are browsing in their dedicated or our DCOS cluster that we were kind of farming out for the enterprise um, for developers to use and develop and deploy applications and be clicking in there. And it's in the back end coming over to our centralized one. It's a nice little demarcated point with its own. Uh, uh, ACLs and security groups that just filter down just to the uh, minutia of what that's uh, supposed to be used for, with the ports unique to the universe. So um, coming down to the wire here on time, so I'll, I'll just briefly mention uh, the Jenkins uh, file deploy pipeline. You've heard me mention pipelines um, throughout the, the talk here on these couple slides. So us wanting to be good stewards of our own enterprise, we have a group that kind of rolls out high available, um, redundant uh, CI/CD tool capabilities for us to consume. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we uh, kind of look at their offering, and uh, they chose Jenkins for um, certain functionality. Um, so there, we could have gone with GoCD, we could have uh, done Git CI, um, but because Jenkins was there, um, if you haven't used Jenkins in the last year for kind of pipeline use cases, I uh, highly recommend go check it back out. Um, they've uh, released probably a one-to-one -one feature capability to most of the other popular um, integration tools, deploy tools um, that have all the major offerings where you can do stages in parallel um, and uh, capture artifacts and um, do all the normal pipeline things. So now we have an internal uh, master branch that holds a Jenkins file 
and we go in there and we define our little pipelines and our unit tests along the way, and uh, uh, it allows developers to kind of show up to us with their wants out of the cluster, um, and the plan is when they want to consume something out of the cluster, they can kind of define in the, maybe the marathon JSON or a, a scale recipe or um, even a bash script that's just a bunch of DCOS CLI commands to provision stuff out of the environment. Um, we see them commit into their branch to want to consume our resources. Um, that spawns off a pre-agreed upon process with our security to go and see, oh, that's the change these people want to make. Uh, they go off and do whatever they got to do just for that tier three, the new, new tenant that wants to show up. And uh, they come back with a green light, go ahead, thumbs up. Um, and then we merge request that um, and spawn off our, our pipeline. And now we can do testing in an isolated uh, dev test stage process that everyone is uh, kind of moving towards nowadays to get stuff into production and fail those builds quickly, uh, learn quickly how maybe we're rolling out a new version 111 of DCOS and we know we've got scale version three or whatever and other kind of tenets that are part of the known baseline and see how changing a rev of one thing kind of breaks others or maybe it all works and it goes through. Um, if we've done our job well defining those unit tests ahead of time, integration tests and feature tests um, and security checks. Uh, we have that confidence that why stop it, let it roll all the way through our environments, go out into production. So um, I might kind of get off the, the stage bullet before I hand it back over to Todd to close us out. Uh, what's next? Uh, we know we're interested in things like uh, Spinnaker uh, and their uh, new support for DCOS. Uh, so we want to kind of get off the uniqueness of having to do our own kind of platformy uh, glue scripts because um, that's more stuff we have to maintain. Um, the less we have to uniquely maintain that's unique to us, the better. Uh, leverage common tools, I think a, a common theme here this week. Uh, uh, Terraform. Um, we're doing kind of trickery and user data and putting stuff in S3 buckets and curling stuff around uh, to kind of s seamlessly design this pipeline and moving artifacts around. So um, Teradata is a nice way that, um, I failed to mention this earlier, so I'll just do a quick highlight on it. Um, the only way we could get to the other side is the accreditation process um, with security because that's not usually a process measured in hours or days or weeks or sometimes not even months, span a year or so. Um, was to work with them, and they're very flexible, so I, kudos to those um, internal security guys at NGA. Um, they kind of focused on uh, infrastructure as code in a master branch of a GitLab repo. And we can go define how our environment's gonna be running over here is going to look, and it gives us a CM uh, approach to kind of make changes and, and figure out the known state at any given point in our um, environment. Security like that, they have a, a common place to go. Um, previously, you would have a multi-million dollar uh, DOD contract with a big contractor and they go off in their own four walls and they design and build this thing and, and they show up to NGA, put it out there, and that's day one of security starting their scrub process going through looking at operating systems and the password requirements, and, yada, and they surface out many, many um, days later out the other side with kind of a, a review of how things work. Um, so here they get to be just in tune as we're developing as the developers for coding the infrastructure and see the changes being made and say, hey, I, I like what you're doing here. You're closing these vulnerabilities. That's great. Um, and along with that are the, the active governance kind of things with Ansible or, or Puppet or whatever that's in the live environment to trigger and notify people that a change has been made that maybe wasn't approved or is approved or we can catch that. Um, so I'll kind of stop there because we only have a minute left, but hand it back over to Todd. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. So now we can have fun. So then what's next for us is now that we've done all the hard work up front, automated and made it very easy for customers to come in and consume at the tier three level and not have to be down at the tier two and tier one level, now we, we can focus on objectives that really push our functional geospatial management uh, responsibility for DOD and IC to these enduring principles here. Geospatial processing at a global perspective, um, we're embarking on a major push for bringing in data science tradecraft in our agency. Um, and what we see is that the culmination of these actually uh, provide a different way of thinking, uh, business intelligence, and how we think about innovation uh, and challenges to bring that in quickly and insert them. Uh, insider threat, cybersecurity. Um, and I'll, I'll foot stomp the one uh, that's really uh, driving all this is to, to be prepared for the encroaching sensor phenomenologies that are going to coming in to, to need to be processed against. And ultimately, to um, truly have multi-data center functionality 
and I'm really, really interested in, and excited to see what's happening in the community with respect to that. Um, we're almost there. So um, we do have one more thing. And so NDAS has been an effort to streamline, make it repeatable, provide it for people to use and consume and create and control their own destiny. So today we're officially announcing that we're in the process of open sourcing NDAS. It'll be on NG, uh, GeoInt, I'm sorry, uh, GitHub slash NGA GeoInt slash NDAS. Uh, so you can check that out over the next couple of months and you'll start seeing bits to flow in there. Uh, everything we just walked through is completely wrapped up in that open source project. So thank you.